Praise the Lord, everybody. Take your Bible, please. I've been waiting for the moment to start preaching. It took a little while to get here, but we're here now. 1 Peter chapter 4, as we go back into our study of Peter. We're going verse by verse through the epistle. I've entitled the message today, Last Day's Ministry. And I believe that Peter has some very important words to share with the church regarding the last day. So why don't we stand together? 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. And, and as I read this, follow along in your Bible and let the word of God penetrate your heart. This is the word of God. He says in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. What a way to begin a sermon in a passage. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. I just wonder if Peter knew something about that whole thing, you know. Sometimes maybe he opened up his house and he wasn't so happy about it, but he learned his lesson. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, little part there. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold or multifaceted grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for the message you put on my heart to share today. Lord, help me to preach it uh, clearly, articulately, and, and with the anointing of your spirit, Lord. Please fall upon me. Anoint my lips that I may say the things you want me to say. Anoint my spirit that I may be quickened to know the direction you're leading us. And Lord, may everyone here, everyone online, anyone that hears this later, be touched by your presence during the proclamation and preaching of your word today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen and amen. You may be seated. So last time we were here in 1 Peter, we looked at verses 1 through 6. And I think we have to just kind of get a quick little refresher about that because verses 7 to 11 kind of fall into place after verses 1 through 6, obviously. But uh, that message was entitled, Christ's Sufferings and Our Victory. Through Christ, we have the victory over flesh and spirit. Verse number one says that we're to have the same mind as Jesus had when he came. Verse number two says now that we're born again, now that we're redeemed, for the rest of our lives we will live for the will of God. Anyone remember that message two weeks ago? And so water baptism exemplifies that. We die to self. We live anew in Christ Jesus. We feel the struggle. We feel the battle. But we feel the presence of God. And through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. Whatever you might be dealing with, whatever's going on, the Word of God says through Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Now, you could take that to the bank, church. You, whatever's going on in your life, I can't get into all the specifics of life, but you know what you're dealing with. You know, you know what you're struggling with, what you're thinking about. And may the Spirit of God lead you deeper into the things of God. You have a victory through Jesus Christ. Now, in this day and age, in 2024, you have a victory in Jesus Christ. But verse number seven, I, I think, really tells us something so important. In that context of we're surrendering to the Lord, we're submitting to God, he gives us the victory, hallelujah. It's a battle, it's a struggle, but we're going forward. But he says, the end of all things is at hand. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean, Peter? The end of all things. I believe he's talking about the struggle, the conflict, the battle, what, what I would call the holy tension between a... a a worldly people serving a holy God. We feel, we deal with issues every single day. Every day is a battlefield. Every time we awaken in the morning, there's an enemy after us. There may be people in flesh after us. It's a battle, it's a struggle, but the end of all things is at hand. And for that we say, hallelujah. 
there's end in sight to this rat race that we're running in. Come on. This is what Paul say, what Peter's saying here. There's, a, there's an end of all these things. And of course, this has a reference to Jesus' return. The rapture of the church, the last days. We're in the last days right now. Some people say we're in the last of the last days. Well, let's turn to Hebrews 1. Well, we have it on the screen. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. It gives us some insight into what, what we're talking about. You know, in, in our country, we have different time zones across the country. How many of you can't stand when we change the clock? I can't stand it personally, but I guess we have to. If we didn't, we'd be, we'd be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But in the Bible, there's only two time zones. And I want to show you, Hebrews 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. That's one time zone, time past, when he spoke by the prophets. God spoke by the prophets. From Genesis to Malachi, there were prophets. The voice of God spoke, you know, through the prophets. But then it says in verse number two, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, etc. But in these last days, so there's two time zones, time past and the present, which is the last days. I, I find it interesting here. I mean, we could add a couple of other time zones. Let me just digress for a minute. We could tack on a seven year tribulation period. We could tack on a thousand year millennial reign after that. And then we could tack on eternity with new heavens and new earth. But for the sake of the believer going through the battles and the struggles, there's two time zones, time past and these last days. The problem with this is that this was written in six, between 64 and 68 AD. We've been in the last days ever since then. So we're in the last days, but we've always been in the last days. The church age is the last days. Paul wrote in Romans 13, 11, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I think about that. I think when, when Pamela accepted the Lord, the Lord is nearer in 2024 than he was in 1977 when we accepted Jesus. And everyone was talking about it then. And he's nearer now than he was in my birth year of 1951 and whatever year you were born. And Jesus is nearer now. And Jesus raised a, a great question in Luke 18, verse 8. He said, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will you really find people trusting, believing, waiting for his return? I say yes. Maybe a lesser amount than one may have figured, but there's always going to be a remnant that will have faith and trust in the Lord. I, I pray that you're part of the remnant. The remnant. Now I've, I've entitled the message Last Day Ministry not to be confused with another ministry called Last Days Ministries. Anyone ever hear of Last Days Ministries? Some of, some of us that have been around, we understand there was a ministry very prominent in the 70s and 80s. It was headed up by Keith and Melody Green. Keith Green was a prominent, uh, prolific Christian songwriter. He was a Jewish young man that accepted Jesus. His music is still available online. He, we sing his songs sometimes. But they had a ministry called Last Days Ministries. He was killed in a, in a plane crash in 1983. Melody kept the ministry alive for a number of years. I think now you could find it online. But this isn't that. This is a message entitled Last Day Ministry. So we're going to go verse by verse through this. And then I want to give you some necessary ministries in these last days. Are you with me, church? Are, you, are we on the same page? So verse number seven, we already started, but uh, the end of all things is at hand. Uh, you know, we won't delve into this too far, but some of the signs of the last days or the last of the last days would be a great apostasy, a great falling away. It would be uh, false teachers and prophets rising up. It would be open rebellion and immorality in the church. Unfortunately, we see that today often in these mega churches, well, not only mega churches, but in many church settings, we see a lot of immorality. 
but we also see an outpouring of God's grace. Because at the same time when there's, say there's trouble in the American church, in other parts of the world, even in America, there are thousands and thousands of people coming to Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit. The word is going out all over the world. But the end of all things is, is coming. The end of all things is at hand, it's approaching, it's coming soon. We read in Acts 1, verses 10 and 11, as Jesus was ascending that day, two men in white apparel spoke to his disciples, and they said, why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so the second coming of Jesus is absolutely an essential part of the gospel message. We say it often, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Matthew 24, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. They'll be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, life will go on and on and on. And one day as the rain began to fall, one day Jesus will come back. The rapture is going to happen. It's going to happen. And Peter's just reminding the church, the end of all things is at hand. That helps us, it should help us, recognize that whatever we're dealing with right now, whatever stress and anxiety and whatever wants to just, you know, ruin our lives, is only temporary. Everything in this life is temporary. But our eternal life, of course, is everlasting and eternal. Uh, if you're interested... I'm reading a book called The Great Disappearing by David Jeremiah. The Great Disappearing, it says, 31 ways to be rapture ready. <laughs> I like that. I'm only in chapter one, but I like it so far. But there's a great emphasis in the church today. I mean, it's only natural. The things on the news that we hear about, of course we're thinking about the Lord's coming. But he says, you know, uh, verse number seven, uh, the, uh, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, so be serious. Be sober-minded. Be clear-minded. Be sincere. And be watchful in your prayer. So Jesus' is coming affects how we pray. So let me ask you, church, do you see the signs of his coming? Some of you will say, man, absolutely. But others will say, no, it's always been like this. I don't know. I think about the wars the rumors of wars, the crime, the violence, the disregard for life, for children, for the elderly, for God's creation. I think about e economic instability worldwide, not just here. I think about political unrest worldwide. I think about the bizarre weather we've been having for the last 10 years or so. Did you know the other day in Saudi Arabia, a thousand people died of heat stroke going on a pilgrimage? I could see one or two maybe. A thousand people died walking along the road? This is very unusual to me anyway. But Jesus is coming. What are you saying? The end of all things is at hand. Jesus is coming. So pray. Be a praying people. You know, be, be, pray pointedly. Pray intelligently. Pray seriously. This is why sometimes when I catch a, a certain ministry on Facebook or YouTube and, and someone's acting kind of silly and you know, trying to be a comedian. I mean, there's, there's points of humor. I get all that. But bottom line is, we're in the last days. Church must be about the kingdom of God. It has to be about the kingdom of God. It can't be about going to the amusement park all the time. You know what I'm saying? So be serious, pray seriously, not frivolously, robotically, uh, and sincerely. Pray with an end time urgency. But then in verse number eight, boy, Peter, he just lays it on. Above all things, okay, above this battle we're dealing with, verses one through six, above, you know, the, the, above praying and being sincere and all this other, above everything else, have fervent love for one another. I like that. Back to basics in the midst of the idea that Jesus is coming back. John 13, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. All the world will know you're my disciples by how much money you have in the bank, 
by how many people attend your church, by how beautiful you look, how the expensive clothes you wear, the car that you drive, your bank account. No, the people will know you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Paul you know, carried the theme, 1 Corinthians 13. Even if you speak in tongues but don't have love, you're like a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Even though you may prophesy, and have knowledge, and have, uh, have, um, uh, ha understand great mysteries, and you have not love, you are nothing. If you could give your life to the poor, give your possessions to the poor, have your body burned for the cause of Christ, and you don't have love, it profits you zero. I would say this, as pride and arrogance is a mark of Satan, love for one another is the mark of a Christian. The verse, amen? Yes. The second part of verse number eight says the reason why. For love will cover a multitude of sins. That's a quote from Proverbs 10, 12. I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, I also came to a lot of people because I went to church. When you go to church, you meet people. But you have to meet people. But God used people to bring healing in my life. God healed me, God saved me. But God knew I needed people in my life to reassure what he was doing. They would love me, they would listen to me, they would care about me, call me up or whatever, visit me. They would you know, tell me things, be kind to me. If I skip church for a couple of weeks or months, they call me up and say, hey, Rick, where are you? You know what I mean? God, God uses people to cover sins in our lives. Love heals, forgives, mends, cleanses us. Ephesians 4.15, Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, speak the truth. Now, some people love that. I'm going to give them the truth. But he says, speak the truth in love, right? James says, if someone falls away, you, you, you who bring them back, you will save a soul. You could bring that person back. I say, you know, we, we need to love people to Christ. We need to love people back to Christ. And we need to love people that are in Christ because none of us have arrived yet. So Peter's laying it down. We have to pray with sincerity and all that. And Jesus is coming. But in the meantime, go back to what Jesus said. Love one another. Verse number nine. He goes a little bit deeper. He says, be hospitable to one another. I do like that he says without grumbling. Because I suppose you could be hospitable and grumble, which would defeat the purpose. Come on over to my house. Well, I can't stand having company in my house. I have nothing in the refrigerator. Come on over anyway. No, no. I, 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 I do think, I can't prove it, but I think maybe Peter had some experience in this. I don't know. Maybe. He's talking from experience. I don't know. But, you know, be, be hospitable, be friendly, be welcoming. I, I, I encourage people to be hospitable in church to welcome people, be friendly to people. You know, show someone where the coffee is after church and sit down and talk to somebody. But it's an expression of love within the body of Christ. I would say, you know, this could, this could apply. Open up your home for a Bible study or for prayer meetings or just fellowship to have a cup of coffee with someone or, or take someone out for a meal or a, a coffee or whatever and do it without grumbling. Just, just be hospital, be loving towards someone. In verses 10 and 11, you know, he goes on to another little tangent here. He says, as each one has received a gift, that one line is very preachable right there. In case you're wondering, do you have a gift? This says each one has received a gift. Well, I could ask you, what is your gift? You may not have the gift of being a pastor, but you should have a gift of something. Some people have a gift of cleaning. Some people have a gift of teaching or whatever, but what is, I like that. You know, to each, uh, to each, one, each, each one has received a gift. And so, so minister uh, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold, multifaceted grace of God. I want to turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we won't go into this too deeply, but 
this is another lesson in and of itself, but in Romans 12, Paul is saying, uh, verse number six, he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, we call these the grace gifts. I believe Peter is referring to these in Romans 12 and six through eight, but Peter's saying, look, everyone has a gift. You know, whatever your gift is, you know, each one has a gift. You know, I, I would say, try to find out what your gift is. I, when I first came to the Lord, I didn't know what my gift was. I found out one of my gifts was painting. I could, I could paint houses. So the pastor had me paint the windows of the church one day. It was a great ministry. I'm, I'm a good cleaner. I could clean the church. I'm not so good at home, but I, I'm working on that. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I remember preaching on these three verses several years ago, but having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. That's another thing. It's like, I, I remember I had a friend that had a friend and my friend's friend was a really good singer. And then my friend kept saying, this guy's a great singer. And I kept on saying, where does he sing? He goes, oh, he doesn't sing anywhere. I said, well, how do you know he's a great singer? I just know, just trust me, he's a great singer. I want to say, if he's a singer, he needs to go somewhere and sing. And in the same way, if you've got a gift, you've got to use the gift. Oh, well, you can tell her you have a gift of whatever. Well, <laughs> what are you doing with it? So you know, use the gift. Now, I'll just go rather quickly through here. If you have a gift of prophecy, and we talked about this, but in other words, if you have some of the spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians 12, prophesy in proportion to our faith. If it's ministry, so what, what, you have a gift of ministry. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit. Use it in our ministering. If you have a gift of teaching, teach it. If you have a gift of exhorting, encouraging others in their faith, exhort. If you have a gift of, um, of giving, give with liberality. If you have a gift of leading, lead with diligence. And you have a gift of mercy, you know, show mercy with cheerfulness. Now, everyone should have a piece of these gifts anyway. But in, in that, we excel in some of these gifts. So I would say to you, going back to 1 Peter uh, 4, uh, find out your gift. Look at Romans 12, 6 through 8. Try to pray and think, Lord, what is my gift? Could I lead? Could I teach? Could I, could I show mercy? Well, we should all show mercy. But someone needs to step up and give a little extra dose of mercy every now and then. We all have a gift of giving. We all should be giving. But some can give more because we have more. Or we have more faith to give more or whatever. So anyway, so, so back in uh, 1 Peter 4, 10. As each one has received the gift, minister it to one another within the body as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Yeah, because see, your gift will be an expression of God's grace. You may not think so, but your gift of giving someone a cup of coffee may bless somebody's socks off. It's the manifold grace of God. Your gift of saying, hey, man, you can make this. That would be a blessing that someone just needs to hear. It may not be the result of someone kneeling down at the altar, but it may be someone feeling better about themselves and feeling good with God. So whatever your gift is, use it, you know, to, to express the manifold grace of God. And then verse number 11, if anyone speaks, um, I would say if anyone teaches or preaches or proclaims the, the word of God, you know, do it. Um, where are we here? Do it uh, uh, as the oracles of God, you know, do it with a sense of holiness, a sense of respect and honor, a sense of uh, dignity. It's a heavenly gift to be used by God to speak the word of God. And you have to know, church, for me to be preaching the word of God, I absolutely take it very seriously. It's an honor to break open the book of life, the bread of life. I feel unworthy, but I feel blessed that I could do it. Pamela knows, I, I don't just wing it, I never wing it. But I, it, it's an honor. So whatever, if you speak on behalf of God, you may be witnessing on the street to someone, but you have to speak as an oracle of God. You're blessed, you're anointed, you're the man or woman for the moment to bring God into the picture. And so take it with, with reverence and honor and rejoicing that God used me? Yeah, he wants to use each of us. And then he goes on, like he says in verse 11, 
If you minister, if anyone ministers, well, if anyone cares for the poor, gives food away or touches people some way, gives somebody a ride, you know, do it in such a way that God may be glorified and not yourself. This is what he's talking about. You may speak, <clears throat> you may do something spectacular for the kingdom of God, but if you do it for your own exaltation, you will crash and burn before you know what hit you. But we do all these things that God may be exalted, right? But God may be glorified uh, through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion or the sovereignty forever and ever, amen. So th this is what you know, Peter's saying. These are last days, last days ministry going on. And you know what, if, they, if he's telling them to do it in 64 to 68 AD, how much more important is it to do today? You know, we're still holding the fort down. We're still believing, right? We're still trusting. We're still counting on God to come through. But as we're waiting on the Lord and we're in this battle, we have the victory now, hallelujah. But God has given us specific things to do while we wait for his return. And church, one day, we're gonna hear that trumpet sound and we are out of here. We are out of here. In the meantime, what are we gonna do? So I wanna, <clears throat> I wanna talk about this, give you four, four ministries that really should be happening as we await the Lord's return. So starting at verse number seven. The first ministry that we should be having as we wait for the Lord's return is the ministry of prayer. Could you imagine a church that doesn't pray? I think there are some churches that don't pray. I don't want to be that church. I want to be a church that's known for our prayers. Verse 7, Jesus is coming, so pray. The end of all things is coming, so pray, be sober-minded, serious, be focused, and be watchful of what's going on. Are, can you discern the times around us, the political climate in our country? I don't know what's going on with all that, but to me, it's, it's symptomatic of a great spiritual thing that's happening. There's a great divide in the land. Those that will trust in the Word of God and those that don't want the Word of God. And so be watchful uh, in all these things. Be watchful. Note, note the times, uh, the events that are happening. Prayer is our lifeline to God. If, if Jesus said, Matthew 7, if we ask, we will receive. Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. James 4, 2 says, you have not because you ask not. We just read earlier, Luke chapter 9. All power has been given to you. You've given d dominion and power over demons and sickness and health. That, I've known that verse for, for a long time. But this past week, something happened in my spirit with that verse. It became personal for me. I mean, it was always a little personal. But it became really personal for me. He's given me and you power over demons power over sickness and disease. And he said, I'm, I'm anointing you to preach the gospel. I'm thinking, the gospel? Yeah, the gospel. Souls can be saved, people can be healed, and people can be delivered of demons. I don't know about you. There's demons all over the place. There's spiritual strongholds all over the place. You see people on TV or on the news, the way they talk, the way they act, they are demonized. And the Lord has given us the power and the anointing to stand against that, as I said earlier, to push back the forces of hell. You know, they will not win. The church will win by pushing back the forces of darkness. But we better be prayed up. As a friend of mine told me many, many years ago, no prayer, absolutely no power. No prayer, no power. You can take that to the bank, church. You want to have power? You want to do great things for God? You want to be strong in the spirit, be a strong man and woman of God? You want to be a good parent or whatever? You got to be a praying person. There's no doubt about it, and there's no getting around it. Prayer is our lifeline to God. The first thing Peter says is, the end, of, the end of time is coming. All things are coming to an end. So be focused and sincere and watchful and pray. 
Pray that, you know, I know Jesus is coming. I better get right. I better be ready. I want to pray for my kids, my grandkids, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my friends, my co-workers, whatever. I want to be a man of prayer. So I want to invite you, church. I'm going to be flat out and extend the invitation to you. <clears throat> Every Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we have a live stream prayer meeting. It's on Facebook. If you don't have Facebook, go to YouTube. It'll be on YouTube too. Six o'clock, every Sunday night, we pray for one hour. But we have 25, 30 people in there sometimes. That's really good. Some people, I don't know who they are because they don't make comments and I, don't, I, I can't identify them, but that's okay. But I would love to see 50, 60, 70 people praying online. Why not? Why can't we do that? See, some of us just have to change our schedule a little bit to allow for that. Every Sunday night, 6 o'clock prayer. So tonight, 6 o'clock. I want to invite you to church on Monday night. Some people say, you know, we don't have Wednesday night fellowship anymore. We do that online. But every Monday night, there's prayer in the church. I'm calling it prayer and fellowship now. There's prayer in the church every Monday night at 630. I invite you to come be a part of those, those prayer meetings. Thank you, Bill and Esther, for heading that up. Um, four times a year, we have a prayer week. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. Sounds like a song I used to sing. But, uh, so we had just had our second prayer week in, in the spring. <laughs> summer, winter. Uh, <coughs> Did you come to it? <laughs> so some of you said, yeah. I invite you to come to the quarterly prayer meetings. I have a better one for you. I invite you to come to a prayer meeting that we have every morning. We start as soon as you wake up in the morning. This prayer meeting is so good, you don't have to comb your hair, wash your face, or brush your teeth. You can get a cup of coffee, whatever you want to do. No one will see you because you're going to do it at home. But in the spirit, you're going to join me in prayer every morning when you first wake up. I'm, I'm there between, say, 6 and 7, 7.30, somewhere around there. And just pray. Just have a time of prayer with the Lord. So in, in our last day ministry, we must be a praying people. We must have a prayer ministry going on. Yeah, we'll pray at church. You know, we do that. But I'm saying let's go beyond the Sunday morning. Again, Luke 18, 8. Will the Son of Man really find faith when he returns? Will he find you praying and seeking the Lord? The second ministry in a last day ministry would be a ministry of love. Above all, above everything else, love, respect, honor one another. Fervent love, you know, deep, unfailing, intense, constant love is so necessary within the body of Christ. Luke 6, 27 to 38, we won't look at it, but in that passage, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, love your enemies. You know, do good to those who hurt you or spitefully use you. Give your things away, give possessions away, but give your kindness and your mercy and your love away. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind and is not rude. Love, verse 8, love covers a multitude of sins. There may be people that are here today, maybe, or people that are going to be coming next week or the week after that want to meet God in a, a hug or a handshake or a, a sitting down and having a cup of coffee together, having an ear that they could talk to would be such a blessing to them. The agape, the, the love of God, the unconditional love of God. It must be the backbone of who we are and what we do. If there's no love, there's no anointing. As we say, as the song says, love God and love one another. I would encourage you to be aware of the fact that we're not all the same people. I mean, we, we're all the same in the sense that we're sinners saved by grace, but we all come from a different place, a different background. My story is different than your story. But every story is interesting, I'll guarantee it. If you take time to listen, every story is so fascinating to see how God moved in somebody's life. Our membership class, the first time two weeks ago, we just went around the table. People were sharing how they came to know the Lord. I was amazed at how, people, how God met people. And I was so blessed to hear their story. 
And so I want to encourage the church to love each other in spite of differences, in spite of age differences, cultural differences, racial uh, uh, differences, life experience. The common element is, is that we all need love. We need to be loved and we need to give love away. So I, I say, may it happen in the church in these last days. Amen. There was a testimony I shared several years ago. Uh, I was, uh, oh, I forget which grandkids I took to the park. But one batch I took to the park one day. And I met this lady that had her grandkids and we were started talking about stuff. And one thing led to another. And I said, oh yeah, well, I'm the pastor of the church, the big white church up on, across the street from Smiley School. And she goes, oh, yeah, I know that church. She said, oh, that's the church. Every time I go by there on Sunday afternoon, everyone's in the parking lot smiling and hugging each other and looking happy. That was the testimony of the church. I was so blessed. I said, well, that's really good that that's happening at the church. But that, see, they will know us by our love for one another. And it's got to be, it's got to be, you know, put out there. All right, let me give you the third thing. And just I'm going to try to wrap this up. Another ministry in the last days is the ministry of the grace gifts. We already talked about it. But I, I want to encourage you, if you feel an inkling to be used in the spiritual realm with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, step out in faith and do that. If you, if you feel like you have a gift of ministry, well, what do you mean? Well, I, I want to thank Brother John Stebbin. He had a gift of ministry. He wanted to start the Valor Recovery Group. He told me this months ago. He had a gift of ministry percolating in his heart. He wants to minister. I said, yeah, sounds good to me. Let's, you know, we'll talk about it. David has a, a gift of ministry for the garden club. Whoever would have thought. But there's something percolating in his heart to do something with this type of a thing. Uh, other people have different types of ministry. Whatever, uh, Patty, I know you have the nursing home ministry. That's wonderful. You know, it's, it's a ministry. But I wonder if, if someone else has another idea. How about a street ministry or... Uh, how about a, I don't know, a, a home group or something? It's just something. Be creative. What about teaching? We need, we desperately need kids, teachers, church. I, I would get on my knees and beg you, but I don't want to do that. But we need, ki we need people to teach our children. We are blessed with kids. We need some volunteers to step up to the plate. We'll give you teaching, curriculum, or whatever, but let that percolate in your heart. I'm, I'm laying down the seed, right? I'm planting seed right here. Maybe you've never taught before in your life. Well, you know what? Every teacher I've ever known always had a first time, me included. When my pastor asked me to teach a Sunday school class, I said, mm, yeah, all right. And this was to adults. Funny story was I prepared all day long for that Sunday school class, 45 minute class. The problem was I was done in two minutes. <laughs> I had 43 minutes, people staring at me. I didn't know what to do. Well, we had a conversation and it was all right, but I'm just saying, you have to start somewhere. You put yourself out there. I hope I'm encouraging you, or I hope I'm not discouraging you, but you, someone may have a gift of exhortation. Now, some people, we should all have that. Like, hey, you can do it. We should all have that positive attitude, but some of us are gifted with an extra dose of exhortation. We may make a phone call or send a text we may reach out in the, in the nighttime sometime when someone you know is struggling. Hey, you can make it through this. You may remember something somebody told you last week and realize they're struggling. I got to give them a call. Yeah. See, I want to encourage you. Whatever your grace gift is, do it. If it's exhortation, don't hide it under a basket, but exhort somebody. Somebody needs to be exhorted. Amen. It, if it's a gift of giving, and we all need to give, we know this, it's offering time, it's blessing time. Hallelujah. But there are some people that can give more than others. And, and I'm not talking necessarily about the amount. The widow's mite was more offering than anybody. It was the least amount, but it was the most in another way. But if we give, just give with a joyful, happy heart, and maybe we can give more. Leading is another one. And mercy I always thought that was curious, that mercy is a grace gift. We, we all need mercy, and we all give mercy. But again, some of us have that gift to give even a little extra more mercy to somebody. Somebody might say, I'm done with that brother. He failed too many times. And someone else will come along and say, hey, wait a minute. 
God has a little more mercy for that guy still. See, that's, that's what I'm saying. Someone needs to step into that realm and bring that touch of God into those situations when other people would write them off. And uh, just to put a little thing on here, the pastor can't do all of this. I mean, I do the best I can. But the pastor's looking for people. In fact, the pastor in Ephesians 4 is supposed to train up the church to do these things, to release the church to do them. And you will, you will feel better about your lives and your faith and your walk with God when you do something with your faith. Amen. The last one is this, verse number 11. A ministry that brings glory to God. Well, that's an understatement, isn't it? The promise is self-glorification. The problem is ministering uh, in our own strength and power, and ministering for our own pat on the back and our own adulation. And I would say this is the root cause of many of the moral failures we see happening today in the church and many failures within the ministry. But it says in verse number 11, whether you speak or wherever you do ministry, do it in such a way that God gets the glory. Amen. Come on. It's not about you or me getting glory. Man, that's so fleeting. Who cares about that? Let God get all the glory. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Psalm 96, I won't take time to read the whole thing, but it says, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty uh, are, are in his sanctuary. Give him glory, strength. Give him the glory to his name. Worship him in the beauty of holiness. My prayer, I, I pray this every day, to, to be honest with you. Lord God, let me preach a really good sermon on Sunday. I'll start on Monday. Let me preach a good sermon on Sunday, a great sermon, that you would be glorified, Lord. I don't care about me being glorified. I just want to do good with what you gave me here. This is what I do. I want to do good for God. I want God to get the glory. I realize when God gets the glory, the, the Shekinah glory will fill this place. And, and people will be attracted to the light of Jesus. They won't be attracted to my light. I have no, I mean, I have a light of Christ within me, but that's not going to attract anybody. The light of Jesus will attract people. So whatever you do for the kingdom, do it for the glory of God. I mean, you might feel good. I mean, sometimes I feel satisfied. I feel, I feel content until I, until I realize I have to do it again next week. Well, okay, we'll deal with that. I've been doing it for 30 years, so I guess I could do it. But I'm just saying, you know, it's good to feel good about it. But ultimately, the glory goes to God. It's about the glory to God. 1 Peter 2, 9, just back a few chapters. We read that passage where the Lord has called us out of darkness that we might proclaim his glorious light and praise. You know, he called me out of darkness. He called me out of nightclubs playing music many, many years ago. He called me out of that nightlife, right? He called me out of that, praise God, to let my light shine in all the world that Jesus is working through me. Yeah, I use that, I, I, I use that as, a, as like a backup, as strength. I don't want to go back there into that lifestyle. I've done that. I've been in the clubs. I've been in New York City. I've done all that stuff, believe me. I thought that was going to be my lot in life, to be a great songwriter and singer and blah, blah. And every door shut, and I was down and out before I knew it. And in that setting, God broke my heart, gave me Pamela, and then gave me, well, gave me Pamela, and then gave us him. And my life has never changed, never been the same since then. It's been changed. So I would be a fool if at this point in my life I wanted to get all the glory. And guess what? You would be too if you wanted to get glory for what you do for God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about doing the best we can do with what he's given to us. We need a ministry that brings glory to God. We used to sing a song called, Let Everything That Has Breath Praise the Lord. Let Everything That Has Breath Praise the Lord. So let me put a little uh, bug in your ear. I think Stacy mentioned it. I, I was doing something. But <laughs> July 7th, we're having pizza and praise. So this is the idea. I'll send it to you in an email. Pizza at 5 Whoever wants to come and praise at six, right here. 
The Medina family will be leading us in worship. Remember they sang a few songs a couple of weeks ago? Just going to throw it out here, church. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give glory to God. You, will you have to change your schedule? Yep. And so will I. But that's what we do. We'll, we'll do the prayer night here uh, intermittently between the worship. So we'll still do that. But I want God to be glorified. They'll sing some songs in Spanish. I want to promote it that way. I want the house filled up. Is, is that, I had to check my heart. Lord, why do I want the house filled up? Is this for my glory? Lord, that's really not for my glory, but I know what I have in my heart. I know that people need what I have. I know people are sad and lonely and discouraged and broken. I know the answer to the problem. The answer is you. So yeah, I want the church filled up. It's not for my sake, it's for your sake and for their sake. I, I do, I want the church filled up. I want a Sunday night service where people are hungry for God. And so I'm asking the church to join me in this. Let's make sure all of our ministries give glory to God. And, and, and I know the Valley Recovery is doing a really great job. That ministry is giving glory to God. The garden thing, same thing, glory to God. People look at the front of the church and they say, oh, people, people taking care of that church. It's giving glory to God. It's good, it's all good. Membership, same thing, it's giving glory to God. God is building his church. So anyway, uh, in summary, why don't we stand together? We're going to wrap this up. Last day ministry. We're in the last days. So we need to be, have a ministry of prayer, a ministry of love, a ministry of grace gifts, and a ministry that gives glory to God. Can I get an amen? amen. We need to have a ministry of prayer. Listen, come to the prayer meetings. Join me tomorrow morning between, let's say between six and seven. I won't see you, you won't see me, hallelujah. Just find a place to pray at that time of day, if you can. If not, do it later. The Lord will put it together later. But know that you're joining with the pastor in your spirit and we're praying together every morning, early in the morning. The quarterly prayer times. Ministry of prayer, ministry of love. Everything we do must have a tinge of love attached to it. The grace gifts, please, church, read Romans 12, 6 through 8. See what your inclination is. Maybe God's, you know, speaking to you about something. Yes, you. Not the one next to you. You can do this. And then a ministry that will always give glory to God. Verse number 11. Let's see. Can we say it together? If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. I, I just love that verse. I love that Peter wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I think he knows what he's talking about. I think he's been through some stuff to get him to the place where he realizes whatever I say or do cannot be in my strength because if it is, I'm going to fall flat on my face. It's got to be in the anointing and the supply of God that he gets the glory and not me. Let's say it one more time. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Every head bowed for just a moment. Hallelujah. Those online, if anyone needs Jesus, if you're online, just make a comment. But if you're here in the sanctuary, raise your hand. If you need Jesus, if you're not sure, just let the Lord know. I, I need to know for sure. We'll pray with you to receive. Anyone, just raise your hand right here. I need Jesus. Does anyone need to make a recommitment to the Lord today? You've had a bad week. You've had a bad month. You had a bad year. You're ready to just surrender it all to the Lord right now afresh. Anyone that needs to get your house in order in these last days that we're living in, now's the time to do so. Yes, thank you. Okay.
Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the, your word that speaks to our hearts today. Thank you, Lord, that we understand we are in the last days and we've been in the last days for a long time, but now we're closer to the last days. We're closer to your coming. We pray, Lord, that we would follow the advice that your word gives us, that Peter, through the working of your Holy Spirit, gives to the church then as well as now, that we would have ministries here in this fellowship, ministries of prayer, ministries of love, ministries of grace gifts, and ministries that will always give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Lord, anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Let us not deviate from the truth. Let us have a humble walk before you. Lord, we pray for the remaining part of this year. This year is half over. We pray, Lord, for the second half of this year to be fruitful in terms of the lost coming to know you, the lost coming to the church, the lost being drawn in by your spirit, by the sign out front or by word of mouth invitation that we may give to them. And also, Lord, that we would see in the second half of this year within the body of Christ here at New Life, we would see individuals rising up. And we thank you for those that have already. But we pray for others that will rise up with ideas and creativity to do something to defeat Satan and to bring the presence of God in the midst of our environment. We pray, Lord, that you would release a spirit within us of, of, uh, of excitement and creativity. And Lord, that we would get rid of the apathetic spirit that says, I'm too tired, I'm too this, I'm too that. And Lord, these are last days. We don't have much time. Help us, Lord, to seize the moment, to take advantage of the, of the time you give us. And we pray, Lord, that this place would be filled with the very presence of God. And Lord, let, let us close out with the, the idea from Luke 9 and Luke 10 that you've commissioned us, you've empowered us, yes. you've, you've told us to go, you've given us dominion over demons and sickness and, and health problems and diseases. You've given us the authority to preach this gospel. And so Lord, we pray that the anointing of your spirit will be upon us, that we may preach your gospel with our words, with our lifestyle, with our attitude. And we pray, Lord, for a rich harvest of souls and may it begin in our own families, Lord. May it begin in our families. So we thank you, Lord. We pray for anyone that raised their hand earlier, anyone online, Lord, may there be a special touch of your spirit upon those dear lives that are surrendering to you again and again and again. And Lord, bless Valor Recovery Group. Let it continue to flourish and to be anointed by your spirit. Bless the gardening club. Let it be a, a good ministry of the church. Bless the membership class and the new members that are coming on board. Bless all that we're doing, Lord. Bless the, the pizza and praise night coming up in July. Lord, it's all for your glory. It's not for us. It's all for you, Lord. Be magnified, be glorified in all that we set out to do. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray your blessing over the congregation. Now, here, those here, those online, no matter where they might be, bless each and every one. Let us have a good afternoon and bring us back tonight for our prayer time. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. And amen. Well, go in peace, go in victory in these last days. Grab a cup of coffee and have some fellowship. <laughs>